Yeah, it's good to see people scattered far and wide. I had to I had to physically move a few people apart earlier. <laughs> um, I think that's why the Chief Health Officer wants us to wear masks, because they know that we like being close to each other. Yeah. Um, now, there's obviously some people on Zoom as well. I saw some earlier. I saw John and Elaine. I saw Judy. I saw John Ballinger. Is that right? Ross Waddell, Faye and Daryl. There's no one on the screen at the moment, but, I'm so, uh, but you guys can tell me if I'm anybody else that have missed. Phil Eldridge. Phil, Phil Eldridge there too. Iris. 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 William. William too. Yeah. Good morning to all of you on uh, Zoom too. I'm looking at the camera. Uh, I can be a politician. <laughs> no, 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 I'm preaching about that today, sort of. <laughs> no, well, it comes from the reading, you know. Who do we owe our allegiance to? Whose is this world? We've got Gloria now, too. Oh, and Gloria. Good morning, Gloria. Special welcome, Gloria. <laughs> Now, uh, this morning, we have a call to worship, which is um, the words on the screen. Get them up. Oh, that, see, that picture shows you, you know, whose world is it? Who do we owe the allegiance to? I was in Canberra over, well, a bit over a week ago. So that's one of the pickies I took when I was there. In the good old Parliament House. Mm. Okay, here we are. We belong to God. God's, God's love and compassion is built into us. God's mercy and hope flow through us. Let's celebrate the powerful presence of God. Let us rejoice in all the opportunities that God gives us to serve. Amen. Let's pray. Living God, Move among us and waken us to your loving presence. When we lose our way and put our confidence in our possessions and our wisdom, call us back to you. Remind us that our very identity is dependent on your abiding mercy. Show us how to walk with steadfast faithfulness following the path of justice and goodness in our daily lives. May our days be filled with joy and hope as we share the good news of abundant life that comes from following Jesus Christ. In the power of the Holy Spirit we pray. Amen. So we're still into Lord singing. So uh, David's going to play our first hymn, and, but the words will be up there for us to soak in and kind of sing inside somehow. <laughs> Thanks, David.
come to God with our prayer of confession. Let's pray. Patient God, we are so easily distracted from what you would have us be and what you would have us do. We allow ourselves to be claimed by the angry and hurting world as though we bore a stamp reflecting the hostility. You remind us that from the beginning your love has been available to us. Forgive us when we so easily turn toward ignorance and greed as ways of living in the world. Heal our wounded souls. Challenge us to be your people, not owned by false promises of instant wealth and status, but strengthened and empowered to be those who bring hope through our words and actions. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <coughs> in our words, in our smiles, in our compassionate living, we bear the image of God. In our willingness to serve the voiceless and alienated, the lost and alone, God's presence abides with us. Rejoice, you are called beloved of God and given God's own stamp in your lives. Amen. Amen. The song, the next thing we're going to have is, is a listening, sort of reflecting song. And uh, it was actually, it like so, uh, Glenn was asking me, are we having any modern things? So I said, well, this one was written this year. Is that modern? <laughs> So uh, we're listening to it and reflecting on it. Uh, I, I, I believe it's probably written by some young people of Leichhardt United Church. And um, they were thinking of the season of creation. And, uh, but when I, was, when, you, when I was listening to it, I've listened to it a few times and the words there. So it's a video. So what happens on the videos of Zoom is sometimes the um, the sound comes through fine, but the picture can be a little bit sort of jumpy. But the words are up there as well, so that'll help you um, listen and watch the words. But it, uh, it uses the metaphor of the garden, which uh, many of us are very familiar with. I've heard a few people doing some gardening recently, and people enjoying the fruits of some gardens. And um, it's using that metaphor in the sense of us being invited to be partners with God's creative spirit of love, bringing life in a broken world. So there's a bit in there about this is, this is God's world and God's working in there and God's inviting us to come in. That's how I felt it uh, was a different angle on today's theme. So let's um, have a listen to this.
questions for us, so um, they're, they're not quite what they seem to be, if you know what I mean. Um, it just starts, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it, for he found it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear by what is false, he will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God his Saviour. Such is the generation of those who seek him. Who seek your face, O God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O you gates, be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of Glory may come in. Who is this King of Glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates, lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of Glory may come in. Who is he, this King of Glory? The Lord Almighty, he is the King of Glory. See you are. Our second reading is taken from Matthew chapter 22 and verses 15 to 22. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know you are a man of integrity 
and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth? You aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And he asked them, Whose portrait is this, and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, Give to Caesar what is Caesar." Caesar's and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks The idea of Australia is pretty all-encompassing. Have you um, considered that concept that Australia is an idea? We live in Australia. We are Australians. We're part of Australian life. We discuss Australian values. Australian history, the Australian economy. We discuss Australian law, Australian governments, parliaments, democracy. We get sensitive about Australian borders, who is welcome and who is excluded. We ponder what is our Australian identity, what it means to be Australian debates over government policies, whether they're existing policies or proposed policies, can take up endless amounts of energy and time. For many of us, either our total income or part of our income is dependent on government, the Australian government benefits. For those with a bit more wealth, our investments are arranged around the government rules for tax and for superannuation and the means testing of benefits. In other words, so much of our day-to-day -day lives are entangled with the concept of the nation-state we call Australia. For Jesus in today's passage from Matthew, the equivalent was represented by Caesar. Jesus here is questioning us. What direction are we heading? Who do we trust in life and death? What is our purpose? What is our meaning in life? Where does our allegiance lie? We're often reluctant to discuss politics, not just as Christians, but anybody. Quite often we tiptoe around political subjects at the so-called typical barbecue chat. We know people can get quite passionate about their politics and we don't want to get into any sort of heated arguments with friends or family. I know I'm quite used to little arguments with family, I suppose, but <laughs> <laughs> sometimes we don't like that either. And it can often be the same at church. We don't want to stir up oppositions and passionate sort of what we call left-right arguments. However, anyone who attempts to argue that Jesus was non-political must come to, to terms with his death. Jesus Christ was tortured to death by a consortium of religious and government officials because he presented some sort of threat to the public order that is political. 
It's in our creeds under Pontius Pilate. This Sunday's Gospel, the dispute about payment of taxes to Caesar, is one of the few explicit passages where Jesus makes any reference to government, to Caesar. It's worth noting that this dispute about paying taxes, Jesus didn't, st Jesus didn't start it. He didn't initiate the conversation. It was his critics that initiated the conversation, not Jesus. That Jesus was executed by the governing authorities with a mocking sign, king of the Jews, over his head, suggests that something about Jesus and his message had serious, deadly serious, political importance. Even though Jesus doesn't explicitly talk much about politics. One reason talking about politics as a Christian is a challenge is because we're all in politics. Like I said at the beginning, we're all enmeshed in, immersed in, both victims and beneficiaries of the omnipotent democratic nation state. There was a time when most people looked to the church for security, for meaning, for eternity, for a reason to get out of bed in the morning. Today we're more likely to expect all that from the government and from the economy to which the government is subservient. In other words, politics has become kind of like the functional equivalent of God. The modern forms of Western government took shape in the period of European history called the Enlightenment. They haven't been around forever. So, you know, around the 1700s sort of time, a key feature of it all was that religion and politics went through the great separation. God was left free to God's own way, while politics was secularised or made atheistic and went its way. Ironically, the separation was pushed to promote peace and lessen violence that was produced by religion, or at least that was the standard account. The result was the modern nation the most violent creation of the modern world. Just do a body count. Compare how many people were killed in the 20th century by their own governments. And compare that to the numbers killed in war. In modernity, we progressed to the point that it was no longer acceptable to ask your children to die for God. Now the only sovereign over life, the only entity worthy of the sacrifice of your children is the nation. Just have a look at that window up the back there. The curious thing is that the omnipotent, sovereign, unaccountable to God nation state has ironically restored the wonder and peculiarity of being a Christian without trying to do so. To be a Christian today is to experience the strangeness of being one of the few people running around who believes that God, and not government, rules the world. Who believes that our ultimate security and meaning is Jesus Christ, not the modern nation. So once there was a time when Christians had a problem with Caesar, but then came democracy, which made the people into Caesar. And now, in theory anyway, <laughs> now our only problem is whether the politics of the right or the left is a closer approximation to vaguely Christian values. In today's Gospel, critics ask Jesus, should we pay taxes to Caesar? It's option one. Or should we not pay taxes to Caesar? Option two. And Jesus surprises by offering a third option. Whose image is on the coin? 
Well, if it's Caesar's coin, give it to Caesar. But you be careful. Don't dare give to Caesar what belongs to God. It's an answer that raises another question. What belongs to God? And the answer to that question was known by every person who witnessed this little exchange between Jesus and his critics. Peter read it out. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. We are God's property. That's option three. God created and therefore owns everything. Not much left for Caesar. In this exchange, Jesus explodes a rather narrow debate about taxes into a holy matter of worship. Whom do we trust in life and death? To whom do we owe ultimate allegiance? This exchange reminds me that Jesus Christ doesn't mesh well with the politics of the right or the left. Christians practice a unique politics. It makes a difference that Matthew says that the baby Jesus' family were immigrants into Egypt. It makes a difference that Christians are commanded to give food, shelter and hospitality to all in need, regardless of whether the state thinks they're criminals or not. As our government defends its borders, and that's what governments are obliged to do, what difference does it make that Christians can't think of any intellectual or theological means of honouring any national border in our preaching, in our enacting the gospel. Our missionaries go everywhere with the gospel because we believe that God's sovereignty is greater than the sovereignty of the modern nation. Jesus makes no attempt to explain what exactly belongs to Caesar and what belongs to God. Perhaps that means his disciples are left to decide this matter for themselves. More likely this means that his followers are to live in tension when it comes to what they should give to God. Surely the emphasis here is on the allegiance that God deserves because of what God owns. Christianity has had friction with every politics in which it has found itself, including the very first state where the faith was born. Western Christians have bought into the dodgy notion that we had at last created a culture in which people could worship Jesus without getting hurt, a world in which we had at last created a government that was roughly the same as God's kingdom, where democratic values are closely aligned with Christian values. Now we're having the odd experience of feeling like missionaries in the very culture we thought we owned. It was not that long ago that a very prominent ex-Prime Minister of ours gave a speech where he said, the imperative to love your neighbour as you love yourself is at the heart of every Western society. It expresses itself in laws protecting workers, in strong social security safety nets, and in the readiness to take in refugees, in what makes us decent and humane countries, as well as prosperous ones. And then, in literally the next breath, he said, this value was leading us into catastrophic error. On any political issue, questions of left or right are only fleeting. Rather, we can be asking questions of greater depth, like who is the God whom we are attempting to worship? What is the life that is worth living? 
Questions like these help us challenge the all-consuming, God-like presumptions of modern secular politics. As Christians, we also need to strongly resist the attempts to force the Christian faith into something that's personal and private. The claims of the Christian faith, like any religion I know of, are inherently public, worldwide claims. Jesus Christ isn't only interested in conquering my heart, he wants everything. Render to God what's God's, namely, all of it. We must not buy into the notion that Christianity is mostly private and personal, but occasionally goes public and political. A public faith means we believe God is everywhere and that Jesus died for everyone. A private faith draws boundaries between people for whom Christ died and then defends those boundaries with murderous intensity. Christians, if you like, carry two passports, one for the country in which we find ourselves and another for that baptismal nation being made by God from all nations. A realm not made by us and our savvy political strategies, but a world made by the active grace of a loving God. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> So I'm going to have a prayer that you can think about in terms of offerings, which as you know, there's a plate there and we can give electronically. But it's also, as I've just been led by Jesus, it's about everything. Let's pray. God, source of all that is, lover of justice and source of equity, Help us live boldly and truthfully as we seek to follow your ways. Embolden us to share with others the gift of grace that you have so abundantly given to us. Receive and bless all that we offer you that we return to you now. In the name of the one who gives us life, we pray. Amen. So the um, hymn or, that I wanted us to um, sing slash enjoy slash reflect on um, is um, Christ be our light. So it, it is one that is... Um, it's a relatively recent hymn, and um, I found it in, in being sung on the Songs of Praise, you know, the Songs of Praise on TV, so we've got a nice picture of that. Again, you'll see the video will be the, the words and the music are there.
Hello again. <laughs> How's it better? Yeah, doing a double work today. Uh, it's famous, obviously, in a way. Um, let's, uh, let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Father, your word tells us that you dwell in light unapproachable, whom no man has seen nor can see. Yet you have revealed yourself to us in the face of Jesus Christ. Father, we worship you that you are only in control of this world, even though from where we stand, from our limited perspective, we might be tempted to think otherwise. Those things that are amiss in this world, we're moved to pray for. As Andrew has talked to us today, your word shakes us from our complacency into action. We are challenged by your word. Father, despite the imperfections we see in our present world, we are moved with thankfulness for your many blessings that you daily shower upon us. For life itself, for the measure of health that we enjoy, for our friends and family, for our church family which you have arranged in order, for the lovely area that we live in, for our community, for the governments of this country, and our freedom to worship you unhindered. And most of all, we thank you for Jesus and the gospel of good news. We thank you that we live in such a lovely part of the world, in a loving community, in beautiful surrounds. We thank you that many in the community are concerned with improving the lives of others, and they volunteer in different ways, including Rotary and Mills and Wells, Red Cross, the op shops and so many other things. And we're a little insulated from many serious issues affecting the world, from serious poverty where people are starving, from climate change, from COVID, from wars. But closer to home, we're aware of domestic violence the decline in mental health in many, worsened by COVID and the inability to socialise, for unemployment, for homelessness. Father, we pray for governments as they grapple with these things, at the same time thankful for peace we enjoy in this country and freedom to worship, which they don't have overseas. We pray for a better and more humane treatment of refugees by our government and we pray for the success of the Stop the Shame process in raising that awareness. And we thank you for the United Church being active in promoting social justice issues, for climate change action and a more equitable society. We thank you for our church leadership under Andrew, for the church council and the various decisions to be made. We thank you for our welcomers, the preachers, the musicians, the readers. We thank you for the outreach activities that we have in this church, for community library, for coffee on Wednesdays, and so many more as things will open up. We thank you for John and Janet and for the work in the background that they do to ensure things are running as smoothly as possible. And we pray for those with special needs, for the shut-ins, due to health conditions that they're not able to get out, for those in aged care, who some are watching online today, and for those who get to church but have ongoing frailties of age, age-related issues. 
So Father, we thank you for the love that we enjoy and share, for the encouragement that we give each other. We pray for those away at the moment, for Roy and Ona, and we pray for their safe travels and if there's any others as well. And so Father, we commit all these things into your care, praising and thanking you for all things, as we ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Oh, gee, look, uh, we've got stacks of modern, modern music today. <laughs> Brian Wren is uh, still alive, and uh, and uh, his <coughs> his um, the, the words he put in hymns are very powerful. I find anyway. So uh, again, we'll be listening, and um, the music that goes with this hymn is is uh, not the easiest to sing in any way. So of course, the only person in the world I could find who could play it was Damon. <laughs> and um, so, but the words are fantastic. So we'll we'll do our usual method. Thanks, David. Oh, sorry. And then I'll have the benediction, and then there's a. A, the familiar blessing that we often have, but I've got a soundtrack which is actually like that's written by Robin Mann, and I think it's Dorothy Mann, and others singing it. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you.